Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, talk to you a little bit about how one could use another way of interacting with Earth Engine. The, word, the way we have tried to do this so far has been through the code editor, and that's not the only way in which one can work with Earth Engine. And doing so in a way that is based on the Python API gives us opportunities that I think are very interesting. So rather than start with something uh, which is about configuration and setup and skills and so on, I will start by trying to show you a set of visualizations I tried to, did, tried to do using the Python API. So here's, these are doable within Earth Engine in the code editor. But here is a point I want to make. I think Earth Engine is extraordinarily capable at doing the really hard stuff. Sometimes it's frustratingly difficult to get it to do the simple stuff. So for instance, you can get an image, you can have a time series through which you want to do an animation, but you want to put the date. That's not easy to do in Earth Engine at all. <laughs> it's frustratingly difficult. And for you to take every frame out and find some other way of annotating those images and so on, to make them more unique, useful and so on, is not easy. Whereas if you were doing this with the Python API, it would be really simple to do this. And rather than just try to plead with you that that's simple, I'll, I'll show you a few examples. <laughs> so I've been trying to see how I can visualize something like the monsoons. Here is a rich source of data. There's data on satellite images that show cloud cover. There's daily data. There's data on decadal time series at a daily resolution on precipitation. There's data sets on meteorological drought, where you know, evapotranspiration is greater than precipitation. So they're all there at a daily scale. And what we are unable to do is visualize them in a way that I think most people are interested. Right now, like Cape Town has had in the past, in India there's a serious drought affecting drinking water uh, in, in some of the big cities in India. And large areas are being affected. So ordinary people are really interested to know what's going on. What, what are the patterns of monsoon? How does the drought, how is the summer progressing? And these are things that it, uh, remarkably, a map allows you to see, and you really don't have to be an expert to see this. So I've been trying to just visualize and tell stories with data. So there is a whole set of analytics going on behind the scene, but at the end of the day, it's a video that tells you a story about a pattern. And so this has been possible to do for me. Uh, largely using the Python API. So here is an illustration of what one could do with the Python API. I'll come back into the setting up and all of those things in a little while. So, so what I started to do is this, this, this is data from this year. There is a uh, University of Tokyo uh, data set that just tries to visualize drought, yeah, meteorological drought. So there is, there is the hydrological drought and there is the ecological drought. So this is just one dimension where, you know, the, where these are uh, a series of if evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation, a place starts to get drier and drier. And that's what this is visualizing. And there's a daily data set that's tracking all the other parameters and trying to build this. So this was again something that shows how as the summer progresses, uh, and, and if there is a rain, the conditions are changed. As you see, towards June, where we are, the monsoon starts to come in the south. And that's, that's where things start to change. So this is something that's already very interesting for people to actually see how an entire, at a continental scale, how a place dries up and, and, and starts to get uh, wet again. So, but the reason that's happening, that's beginning to change, is that you have this annual uh, pattern of the monsoons. And there are <coughs> large data sets that actually can help you construct the monsoon, but when I went and looked, I couldn't find something that showed me what is the monsoon? Where do the rains start? How much rain falls in different places? And when does it fall? 
All of this actually can be seen. It's data, but you can actually see it. And when I put it together, I actually thought the monsoon was something that was only about India, but not true. It, it's something that affects a large part of Southeast Asia as well. So it's, it's, it's more the South and the Southeast Asian monsoon. So this is with CHIRP's data. So look at what happens in June, July. So interestingly, this is called the Southwest monsoon, the one that comes in June now. But if you look at the way it is uh, coming here, the front that, of rain goes from the Southeast to the Northwest. See again, the, that's the trajectory. So people got very engaged and started asking, but this is it's the southwest monsoon. Why is it coming in from the southeast? So that was an interesting question. And I said, that's, that's something that's worth looking at. But in any case, the point is when something as large as this is affecting such a vast area periodically, the entire area is pulsing to the timing of this. And here, it was again a very interesting opportunity to try and bring together a data set put together by citizen scientists. There's a large publicly accessible data record of when the, the Pied Kupu, which actually is also, which spends part of the year, part of that population is in southern Africa and in East Africa, and they come across the Indian Ocean. People think that they come on the monsoon winds into the Indian subcontinent, and then they start moving ahead of the monsoon. So we have a 1,500-year-old legend that uh, talks about this bird being the bringer of the monsoon. And there is this whole mythology about this bird <laughs> never drinking from the ground. This is a bird that's supposed to drink directly from the sky. So uh, when this bird gets thirsty, the mythology says, the legend says that this bird starts to call, which is also the time it, it's, uh, the, it coincides with the breeding time. When it starts to vocalize, people say this is when it starts calling for the rain and it won't rain from the ground. So the clouds have to come and let go of the water and that's when the cuckoo quenches its thirst. So people in northern India, so there's a resident population in the south. So in April, the resident population is found in the south. So my animation starts in April and goes up to the end of July. The monsoon starts around June. So as you go, to, so the, at, in April, there are no birds in northern India. So as the migrants start to come, the monsoon winds start to blow from uh, across the Indian Ocean from Africa. Those are the winds that are supposed uh, to be what the cuckoos track and come into the uh, Indian subcontinent. And then they continue to move further up north. They, nobody knows whether it's the resident or the migrant population that move north, but the cuckoos start to move to northern India. Right now in April, they're only in southern India and they start to move. So here was the opportunity for me to put two very different data sets. One is a remote sense data set on, on the timing and onset of rain. The other is a data set on the distribution of reporting dates, the first reporting dates for a species. So when you put together, what I found was actually very interesting. You can see for yourself. So the cuckoo does go a little ahead of the monsoon and people start seeing and hearing the bird and that is, and this is a very, very old observation. So here is something that connects feet on the ground, which is people collecting, the ordinary people collecting data on, on reporting birds. There are the eyes in the sky and then you have an entire mythology that connects people through this. So this was a story that uh, help put together very, very different kinds of data sets. So now coming back to the issue of why was this called the Southwest Monsoon? Because there's nothing that seems to be happening from, uh, from the West. So it turned out that people said it's probably the wind. And that's something that was not trivially easy to uh, uh, animate and visualize. But that was an interesting challenge to see where the wind comes. Does the wind turn? How, what is the wind direction across the entire subcontinent over the, over the year? So this was again something that I was able to do. See what happens to the winds towards the end of 
March and uh, to the, towards the end of May and June. So the thicker the lines, the faster the winds. That's the monsoon. So a lot of the question of, of why it's called the Southwest Monsoon gets answered there. And then you have the Northeast Monsoon. The, the, it completely changes direction and starts moving back in the opposite direction from, uh, from after October. And those are the winds that on which species are, the, the migrant species like the cuckoo are supposed to go back. And there are dragonflies. There are many, many species that do that. Uh, uh, raptors. It, it's, it's a really interesting pattern. So, more simply, here is something that is very trivial. You have a series of images that show you uh, a, a, a true color image of the entire Indian subcontinent. So, there are clouds that are there at, uh, over some place or the other every day. So, can you see the monsoon as it comes if you were to take a view from 500 kilometers up there? So, this is the view you get of the entire monsoon. So these are all uh, real images of, uh, of how the Indian subcontinent looks over the entire year as the monsoon starts to come. So this is can you see the greening behind? So there's precipitation and things are changing. So what is happening is you're seeing everything from above the clouds. But the action, the change, if you're an ecologist that you care about, is happening beneath the clouds. Could you look underneath the clouds? This was the question I was asking, because this is where the land is completely getting transformed. So this is where, with Earth Engine, you can actually do that. And the next one tries to show you that. So you can, just using the median reducer, you can do this. So that's, that's all I did. So here is how, so I was able to take a whole stack of images for every day across multiple years, and say on a, on a given day, this is how the, the uh, uh, this FCC, the false color composite looks. Let's see if there are bursts of green that coincide. We know that the rains come in in June. So let's see what happens. So, I mean, there's a lot to look at at this map. In this map, you can look at the the uh, the lakes, the high altitude lakes of the Tibetan Plateau, you know, freezing and thawing, and there's so much happening here. But what I generally want you to look for is a browning of the entire subcontinent towards the end of April, and then with the with the coming of the rains, with the bursts of green that you see at a huge scale that follow the precipitation that comes with the monsoon. Okay, I'll stop here. So this was my attempt to sell you on why you must care about the Python API. <laughs> <laughs> because it has all the analytical power that Earth Engine provides and some of the immense flexibility that a language like uh, Python allows you to do. So for you to get the, I'll leave this on for a moment, you can uh, get the link and to the, to the presentation at the uh, to the slide deck at the link below. Uh, so, when we're talking about using the Python API, API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's the way you interact with a platform like Earth Engine. So, there are two questions. And I think the first one is why? I mean, we're having a hard enough time trying to get our heads around the code editor in the browser. Why another thing? Uh, the other 
is how. So I'm trying, uh, I'll try and touch upon both of these. And at the end, I'll also leave you with a couple of um, uh, things to start you off if you want to use this uh, to get the Python API started. And for those who've been interested, if you really want to bring what Earth Engine can do with R, and you're really interested in making the two talk to each other, Python API is your friend. <laughs> the only way you can do that right now is through the Python API, and it's not hard at all, as you will see. Okay, so why use the Python API? So this is something you've already seen. This is the entire Earth Engine platform with its geospatial data sets, the algorithms, and the storage and computing uh, capabilities, all of which is in the cloud. So the only way you interact with this is that you send out requests and you get back responses and results. So this is the way you interact with this. So what is happening when you, so this is now a familiar thing for you already. So many, many things that, uh, that mediate the way you interact with this platform is already built into the code editor. There is a window in which you visualize your results if you would like to look at them as text. There's a console. If you want to see them as maps, there's a map window. There are places to hold your scripts and do the versioning. There is a documentation. There are assets that you may want to bring in at various <coughs> points. There is an inspector. There are so many things that are built into this already. But all of this, in some sense, is, uh, is and, and the, the way you're doing this is, is through JavaScript. So there's already, uh, uh, this is your the code editor is giving you a JavaScript API to Earth Engine. So that's basically what you're doing. So the browser is basically your window to connect to the Earth Engine platform in the cloud. And what you're getting there is a JavaScript API. Now, you could just take that out and replace that with a Python API. That's essentially what you're doing. But once you do that, things start getting more complicated. So the, the Code editor is the same for all of us. Troubleshooting is really easy. We get the same thing. If I share my code with you, you get to see exactly the light David showed yesterday. You get to see exactly the same code, exactly the same uh, interface. Everything is the same. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But there are situations where you may want to trade off some of that uniformity for some customizability and, and other kinds of capabilities. So with the Python API, there isn't one code editor kind of interface that you have in the browser. You can have multiple windows through which you look at Earth Engine. So for instance, you can have something, this is for those of you who are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, you could be working with Earth Engine in a Jupyter Notebook kind of interface. So that's one interface that uses the Python API and allows you to interact with Earth Engine using a Jupyter Notebook interface. This is something that Google has started uh, in the last couple of years. It's called Colab Notebooks. These are notebooks, but these are notebooks in the cloud again. They're like, your, they're like all of you are familiar with Google Docs. You have your spreadsheets and your documents and so on. This is a Jupyter Notebook in the cloud. It, it just sits like one of the files in your uh, Google Drive. And you can open it, you can start working, uh, you, you can, but it's a Python environment. It gives you a Python environment, and it really, really takes a lot of the friction out of, of creating and installing and maintaining Python, which is which I'll come to in a bit, which is really the hard part of trying to get a Python environment going. And this should be the most familiar one for many of you who use RStudio. So you could be doing a lot of this, in fact, nearly all of it, within RStudio. So I, I do some of my stuff where I write my entire Earth Engine code and, and run stuff, especially when I'm trying to do something with the outputs that I can only do in R or I can do better in R. That's where I'm doing this. So I'll show you uh, how this, this can be done. So just to get a sense of the trade-offs. So this is not like uh, JavaScript is better or Python is worse. I think it's, it's, it's an entire landscape of trade-offs. And I think for specific things that you may want to do, specific kinds of, uh, of costs and benefits in these trade-offs might make sense to you. So the great thing about the JavaScript API is that it's simple, it's integrated, it's powerful, it's very easy to share scripts. But then, 
if someone wanted to upload a certain kind of a, you have a shape file and you have, you have some obscure format from which you want to upload into Earth Engine. It's, it's, there's a lot of friction. You'll have to then do, uh, you'll have to do a series of conversions and then, uh, you know, add it to assets and it's not a simple thing to do. Whereas in Python, you probably could write a couple of lines of code and get KML or whatever uh, format in which your data is into Earth Engine very, very easily. It's with, with almost no friction. <laughs> and if your data is continuously changing, let's say you're getting points for, for which you need to be sending alerts, was there a fire here or not, you have a stream of data points coming in. Then it's, it's much harder for you to integrate something like that with Earth Engine in a, uh, in a way that can, can iterate whenever there's a change, an update to your uh, uh, list of data points and there's a new coordinate coming in, you want something to run. This is not something you can do in straight away in the JavaScript API. So if you have different kinds of inputs and outputs that you would like out of your interaction with Earth Engine, and you want to be able to customize the kind of things you want to do, it's very limited what you can do with the JavaScript API. So the Python API is, is as powerful. In fact, it's ext it, it'll be familiar if, if, uh, if you have already some familiarity with the JavaScript API, the Python API looks nearly identical. If there isn't very much more of learning one needs to do to start working with the Python API, but it has an, a, a huge uh, range of customization options. It is still easy to share scripts. You can, that's not hard at all. And a vast range of input and op output options. But then the really big cost is that you have to have a working Python environment that you maintain on your computer. And this for people who have Macs and Linux and Windows and so on, it's all different. And everyone's Python environment is different. And to maintain that Python environment in a way that can work for you is not, is not trivial. And I think that is the really big cost that one has to uh, see in trying to put all of this together. So now, having dealt with the why Python API, I will leave you with a couple of examples of how to get started using the Python API, using two, uh, uh, two kinds of uh, options to interact with the Earth, to interact with the Earth Engine. The first is this, the Google Collab Notebook. So this is a link that works. If you have a Google account in which you have signed in, and you have this link, this should open for you. You should be then able. You should then be able to save this as a Collab Notebook within your Google Drive. So that should be simple. Um, so you save a copy within your own Google Drive before trying to run it. And make sure you're logged in with the same email, the, the Google address that you've used to register with Earth Engine. Because there is a part of authentication that has to happen, which will require your uh, login and all of that. So that, that would just make, make this a lot simpler. So uh, <coughs> Okay, so if you have got, if you have clicked through, and this is something you can follow along. This is, it's not too difficult, but if you want to pay attention, you will have the notebook with you, you can do it whenever you like. So it's, uh, for those of you, how many of you are familiar with the notebook metaphor? So notebooks are, so those of you who have worked in R have written code, but people have uh, told you that it's useful, it's really important to document code. So to say, not just what you're writing, but also why you're doing something like this, because you know, you're, even if you're not collaborating with someone else who has to read through your code, you're going to be collaborating with yourself later. So when you go back to your code six months later, often it's very hard to find out why you did something this way, because you've learned something else and you have another way of thinking about it. So it's useful to document. So the, the iterative process by which we do our science uh, requires us uh, to be able to uh, 
make certain decisions, document why we are doing things and make the entire thing actionable. So wouldn't it be very nice if you could write say the, the entire logic of your method section to a paper with the code that was actually generating the results uh, uh, that follow. So if all of it were in one document where that would be, wouldn't that be very nice? So that's exactly what the notebook paradigm, the uh, metaphor tries to do. So you can have chunks of text which you can format and, and, and uh, you know, like, like this. So this is a text cell. So basically it has cells and each cell, uh, you can run code within each cell. Yesterday someone was asking about being able to run code in Earth Engine line by line. It's, it's not really line by line, you can do it cell by cell. And that's, so an object created in one cell is available to actions that you're planning to do in subsequent cells. So it is, it's, it's very, very helpful. But the key thing here is that there isn't a place where you can look at your map easily. And there isn't one way in which you do, can do it. And since this is largely a geospatial analytical platform, that's a very important thing. We have to be able to see what we are trying to do. And, and with that, so the way it works is uh, you will need to get a few, you get a virtual uh, Python environment that, that begins to run. So I don't have to do anything. You can connect to that virtual environment but you don't have to specifically click on this. So I, maybe I should make this yeah, a little. Is that fine or would you like me to make it bigger? Yeah, OK. So OK, so here are, uh, you can run each of these code cells. So there are text cells which you can just read. You can double click on this and you can edit, but that's not what we are trying to do. So here is a code cell and you have a little play button which you can use to run the code uh, code that is there. So right now you're getting a Python environment without Earth Engine, the API, the Earth Engine API. So what you're doing here is you're setting up the uh, environment to include, you're installing the Earth Engine API and another library called Folium, which is used to visualize the outputs, and another small helper library, which I have. Uh, so it, when you click on this, you'll start to see that it, it starts doing things. And this should work for all of you, if, if you're following along. You didn't get, I think, I don't know that many people managed to get copy down your link in the beginning. Oh, the but, the oh, let me. So the link to the collab notebook is on the last slide of this deck. Can I take it off? Everyone done? Okay. Yeah. So there is a warning and an error message which I'm going to ignore now. So what it has done is that it has installed the Earth Engine API. And now the thing that happens quite seamlessly when you use your code ed editor is that you've logged in and it asks you to authenticate and all of that. But right now this is not, it doesn't know who you are and what you're trying, how you're trying to access Earth Engine, whether you are, uh, so whether you are an authenticated user. So you need to do the authentication and this is the way it's done here. <laughs> so it gives you a familiar link that you will see in a moment. And here is my, so I have to allow that. And then I get a, a token of some sort, which I then have to put into the next cell I have to paste it and all of you will get something that's <coughs> different and then I can authenticate it. What happens is that it then stores that token and for this session 
in this note it's only for the session you have to do it again the next time you come back to the notebook if you have shut it down uh, it saves the authorization token and now i'm ready to start using earth <coughs> engine so i have got the library that i need i've done the authentication i'm ready to go so i am just going to i need to initialize this which is done using this ee.initialize and here is something that will print uh, which will tell you if you if you've managed to initialize successfully or not you need to have gone through the steps above to get to this uh, successfully so now i would urge you to look at this a little more at your leisure don't don't uh, maybe you should uh, continue as we are going forward so all i'm trying to do here is i wanted to visualize a map so this shows you how using a folium map one can visualize some data so this is from a, a national park close to where i live where there was this pretty big fire so i have both a true color image and a, a short wave infrared uh, false color composite that shows you the area that got burnt earlier this time so this is this gives you the, uh, this gives you a, an interface a map interface what I have done here is I have added two layers. It's, it's a little different from the way you would do this in uh, JavaScript, but I think it's, it's, not, it's not too hard to catch on. And there are, you can, the, the way you get information about most uh, objects uh, in, you can, you can find out using the type <laughs> command in Python what, what I have created a a sentinel image here. I've loaded a sentinel image here. Or, sorry. Um, so that's the S2. So in Python, you don't need to declare variables with the var <laughs> keyword. So it's telling you that this is an Earth Engine image. And now, if I wanted to find out how many bands that does this image have, there are ways in which I can just get the length. So there is a, a there's a dictionary that you get when you do get info and this can you do this with great discretion because it can be this this can end up being very large objects so in this case it's getting the s2 image getting the info about it pulling the list of bands and counting the length and reporting that it's 16 bands in that image so now to do something less uh, trivial. So wh what would be an example of something you're trying to do where you're really not trying to sit in Earth Engine and, and do lots of stuff. All you want is you want to look at a relationship between two things. Let's say you wanted to look at the relationship between rainfall and maximum EBI for a, for a large area. So you just want to see if, I mean, it, yeah, ecologically what I'm giving is a trivial example, but still. If you're trying to do something like that, what you would like is a large data set that Earth Engine has, and you know that. There's a chirps data set which gives you precipitation. You want it for the whole year. You want some way of aggregating it, say, the total rainfall. So you sum the whole thing, 365 days of chirps data that you sum, and then get for each particular parcel. Let's say you have 50 different places for which you want to get uh, uh, the total annual rainfall over uh, aggregated over the entire area so what you want to do is get the total get one image reduce it over a polygon and get the median let's say the median rainfall within that polygon median total rainfall in that polygon and then you want to just put it in a in a to correlate that against evi values for which let's say you have a whole year stack of evi data from modis and you want to uh, look at this let's say with the maximum EVI and then get a median of the maximum maximum EVI for your polygon of interest. So that's what I'm trying to do here. So what I have done is I've got the districts of South Africa. So for every single district, I'm trying to get the, uh, I'm trying to get the sum of the rainfall, which gives me a whole, so that's for the whole year. So this gives me annual rainfall for 2018. 
And for the same 2018 period, I'm trying to get the maximum EVI. So what I'm going to get is for each district name, I'm going to get total average rainfall, annual rainfall in that district, and the, max, the median EVI, median maximum EVI for that district for the year. As, uh, so I, I just going, I'm going to get a data frame if you're in the R kind of thing with three columns. So that's what I want. I really don't want to go into Earth Engine and generate all of this and then worry, okay, I'm going to export this CSV and then bring that into, I want to visualize this. Maybe you can do all of this in Earth Engine your, itself and you're fine with it, but maybe you really want, for your thesis, you really want to put this graph uh, and you want to generate in ggplot or, or you want you're working in python you want to use something else like say altair so, which is a visualization package so i'm doing exa almost exactly the same kinds of things i'm creating an image with two bands now i'm using image.cat i'm using a reduce regions i'm using the districts that i have uh, uploaded so this is already an asset i'm using those districts and I'm, I'm getting, for each district, I'm getting total rainfall. Uh, it says median, but it should be max EVI. Anyway, so, and I'm going to put that all into a data frame. And when I run this cell, here's the output I get. That's it. So it's processed an immense amount of information and given me just what I care about without I don't have to do any export and it's it's already an object available in memory now which I can work with as I would anywhere else and in the next step I just have to call that object and plot a graph <coughs> so it's 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 really very simple to do this so this is with <coughs> collab notebooks which are notebooks in the cloud so now something that's very similar but works in R. I have almost the same. So I have another link to a notebook shared so you can download that no, uh, R, note, R notebook and, and work with that as well if you would like but that is not going to work like Colab notebooks because you'll have to set your entire, you'll have to set up your Python environment, you'll have to do a lot more uh, uh, back-end work before you can get the R stuff going. It's not terribly difficult, but it may not work. It's very likely that it won't work for any of you right now. But it's, it's there. Once you get your environment set up, it's very simple. So the, the part that you need to do is to set up your environment. So there is this, I'm using the leaflet library in R to, uh, uh, to visualize, reticulate allows Python and R to talk to each other very, very easily. And then I'm using the tidyverse from where I want to use ggplot. So just to show that I can actually visualize something from Earth Engine right inside R Studio. Oh, there's something open here. Okay, yeah. So this is using leaflet. I'm just looking at the night lights, an image from night lights. I, and it's interactive. I can do all of this. I can zoom in. It, all the things that you would expect to be able to do. You can add multiple layers. You can do all of the, get the same kind of interactivity that you're, and Glenn had done something uh, even more fancier with uh, wrapping this into a shiny app and so on. This is, this is for, simple iterative kind of work that one would want to do and I have exactly the same code that was in the Colab notebook that's here so I run run it virtually it's identical the way it uh, runs and this is the output that I get but now I'm going to plot that in ggplot and that's really simple as well so you're without having to go to any of this and th these are these are really s simple ways this is more realistic about how an ecologist 
who's familiar with R and so on is likely to, uh, the reasons why they're likely to be interested in a data set that is so rich, a computing platform that has so much capability to crunch so many, in both of these it's reducing like uh, satellite images uh, from each day of the year for a very large, for the entire country of South Africa and giving you summary statistics by district which you can then plot really very easily. So I hope this was somewhat uh, useful in, in terms of how you can try to fit this into your workflows and uh, if there are any questions or comments I'm happy to take them but that was basically what I wanted to show you with the Python API. Yeah, that's I just got a random question. Maybe it, maybe I wasn't listening because I was trying to <laughs> do the. Um, but so I got a lot of errors when I tried to run some of the code from the Python notebook. The Colab notebook. The Colab notebook. Yeah. I I will have to come and look at what those. Sorry. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sorry. That that's that's probably not shared. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that that you don't have to worry about that. That's fine. I that's an asset that's not shared with you, but I shall do that right now. And I think what one important thing to know that when you're working with the <coughs> maps in R or Python that you built in Earth Engine. It's not, those maps are visualizations the same way that what you see on your map in the code editor is a visualization. It's not, it should work now. Raster. It's not like you don't have it as you might be familiar with with rasters in, in R. It's, that's not the raster with the raw data because that would be a massive file. You still have to, if you want to work with that raster in R or Python, you still have to export that yeah. to drive the story and then import it into R. Yeah, so what, what you're seeing is a visualization of the data. It's not the data itself, the, the, uh, the bands that actually went and you really can't get it from R or Python. It, it's an RGB visualization of those bands. Okay, any, any other questions or comments? Or if you'd like to take a little bit of time and work, and now it should it should work. The error, that error should have gone away. <coughs> I've shared the. Are you able to get it to work now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, otherwise I think we are right on time for, oh, there's one more session, of course, the TensorFlow. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is a requirement. If you want to get to the next step of <laughs> TensorFlow, you need the, the way this is going to work is that you need to be able to do it in Colab notebooks. So it's good that you now have an idea of what a Colab notebook is and how to get Earth Engine going in that. I think I'll hand over to David from there.